I'm gonna start with the with the article. We already talked about it, but uh, how groundbreaking, let's say, it is. Is it is it a big deal like that you find out this about Enceladus? So what we found out on Enceladus is really a big deal. A big deal. It's a breakthrough uh, um, because it's a very small satellite, uh, and everyone was wondering uh, how you can have so much heat produced into that satellite, and no one was able to come with a solution for that. Uh. Uh, so what the team did uh, here in Prague and uh, and in Nantes uh, uh, is it, it's you know fundamental research uh, with some applications and uh, they they found the solution. So uh, yeah, it's it's really breakthrough. And I can tell you that uh, you know some people were wondering because we started working on that problem a few years ago, uh, and I remember um, seminar last year, workshop last year. Uh, where some professors from the U.S. Uh, were really asking us, but publish, publish. I said, well, you know, we are not sure. We, we still need to check a, a few things. And uh, and so it's really a breakthrough. I can tell you from uh, the reactions I have got in the last uh, two days uh, that uh, yeah, people are very excited about this discovery. So uh, in uh, your words, I found it on some, in some article that you predict that the endogenic activity on Enceladus can be sustained for tens of millions to billions of years. So how is it possible? So the, the reason why uh, this energy can be sustained during very long period of time uh, is related to the orbit of Enceladus around Saturn. Uh, and the fact that you have some resonance, what we call resonance, so you have some perturbations due to the other satellites. Uh, and because you keep, as long as you can keep the eccentricity, uh, so the fact that the distance between Enceladus and Saturn uh, can vary uh, during the orbit, uh, then you have the energy. Uh, you, you, you keep producing energy. Uh. If you stop producing the energy, if for a reason uh, the orbit becomes circular, uh, then Enceladus is going to freeze very quickly. You know, it's a small body in a very cold environment, uh, minus 150 uh, degrees, so it's very, very cold. Uh, so it's going to freeze immediately. And once it's frozen, it will water will never appear again. Uh, you predicted that uh, there might be life uh, on Enceladus. And f uh, for some guys from outside of this science field, it could be a little bit confusing. Why does it link together like uh, that there's some heat inside of the Enceladus and how does it uh, you know, mean that there is a life? So on the Earth, uh, just at the interface between the ocean and the, and the rocks and, and the oceanic uh, uh, crust, uh, you have what we call the hydrothermal vents. Uh, and at these hydrothermal vents, uh, which, uh, ex where you have uh, energy here coming from the interior of the Earth, which is going into the ocean, uh, the geologist uh, discovered life uh, uh, more than uh, 20 years ago, for, you know, when the when they dived into these uh, areas. So the environment is very similar. But I have to, to say that we have to be very cautious about uh, you know, this link between water and life. Uh, on Earth, uh, everywhere there is water, there is life. Uh, but you know, life exists everywhere. We, we joke, uh, we say that uh, the Earth is polluted with life. Uh, but on Enceladus, uh, uh, can, ex can we expect life to start and uh, to emerge in this environment? Uh, that would be quite a discovery because for the origin of life on Earth, uh, right now you have two theories. Uh, one theory is that life started on the surface of the Earth, uh, on the continents, uh, where you alternate between dry and wet periods. Uh, and the other hypothesis is that life started exactly in this kind of environment. So the solar system is providing us uh, with a place uh, where we can test this hypothesis. Okay, so uh, you, you say that Enceladus is one of places, one of uh, mm -hmm. objects where the life could yep. be, where we could find some some life. So, what are the others? So, uh, the other target is Europa. Actually, Europa was thought uh, to have the same conditions uh, that we have on Earth uh, much before the discoveries we made at Enceladus. Um, we found out that there is an ocean on Europa and that the ocean is in contact with the rock. Uh, we found that at the end of the 90s uh, with the Galileo mission. So, you know, it has been almost 20 years uh, since we made that discovery. And at that time, uh, we didn't have any information about Enceladus. And then Cassini arrived in 2004. Uh, and a few years after, we found out about the geysers 
engineers. Uh, and so the engineers at NASA said, well, we, we need to go closer and to sniff uh, what's coming out from these geysers. Uh, and there is one instrument which we call a mass spectrometer. So you can analyze the elements. You can uh, determine what are the molecules that are present in these um, geysers. Uh, and by analyzing these molecules, uh, we found out that the, there is hydrothermal activity uh, inside Enceladus. So we discovered that actually there is an ocean, a global ocean inside Enceladus. Uh, and that was really uh, another breakthrough. Uh, but then we had to, to explain how can you maintain the ocean. And that's why the paper that just came out uh, is, uh, is explaining. So on Tuesday, you, you said that uh, actually the, this data you, you uh, take from Enceladus, you came like by co coincidence, let's say, that like you just, you just uh, found some abnormalities, so you start to focus on it. Is, is it right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, 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 we had the magnetometer, uh, and we had the first flyby of Enceladus, uh, and the person who was in charge of the magnetometer, in charge of processing the data, said, hmm, there is a glitch here somewhere. It's not normal. It's not my instrument. My instrument is very good. So, you know, there is something abnormal here. We should go and check what's going on. And so we, we met with um, other members and we said, OK, if there is something, uh, maybe we can try to observe with infrared camera, with the camera, with you know other instruments. Uh, and sure enough, we found these geysers, and that was just amazing. You know, when you have these pictures coming back from uh, uh, 1.5 billion kilometers, and and you see these images, and you you discover something that you did not expect. Uh, you know, no one uh, would uh, expected that kind of discovery when we built the Cassini mission. So you built. Uh a functional, let's say, model of the Enceladus based on the data from Cassini. I'm not uh, meaning any disrespect, but uh, how unsure are you about, about it? How big is the possibility that you are wrong? Well, it's always possible. You know, yeah. it's uh, uh, when you build models. That's what I keep telling my uh, uh, my students and uh, and the young people. Uh, models are always going to be improved, uh, and we are we may be missing. We, we may be making some assumptions uh, which we shouldn't make. Uh, um, so it's it's quite important to keep improving on the models uh, and to assimilate the data uh, uh, as you know as we are um, getting more and more data. So it's important to to build the models, to check the models with some observation, with some data, uh, and then to apply. And you know if it doesn't work, uh, try to find why it doesn't work, which is uh, the, the way we we make some progress in science. Uh, but yeah, we we may be. But the observation shows that there is hydrothermal activity, so we, we need to you know to, to find a way. So it's possible that we we are wrong. You know, with uh, Andre Kadek, uh, a few, and with my uh, the people in uh, in Nantes, in my lab in France, uh, uh, a few years ago, we thought that actually is uh, what we call the tidal dissipation, this uh, energy uh, which is dissipated because of the tides, uh, because of this uh, orbital motion of Enceladus around Titan, we thought, uh, around um, uh, Saturn, we thought that uh, it was mainly in the ice crust, uh, you know, in the upper layer. Uh, we didn't think about the core, because for us the core was solid and there, there was no reason for the core to have a lot of uh, heat uh, by this process, uh, and we were wrong. So. Now we have this new model. Uh, this model explains the, all the observations which have been made by Cassini. Uh, Cassini is over, uh, so we are not going to get some new observations uh, which would tell us, uh, you know, your model is wrong. Uh, um, but, uh, but yeah, we, it's always a possibility that we are wrong. What we know is that the geysers are, are there. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. you know, even for just for the science, what we want to do now uh, is to get back there with something um, with an instrument which is much better than what we have on Cassini, because you have to keep in mind that Cassini was built uh, in the early 90s. Uh, no cell phone at that time. <laughs> you know, the technology was very different from the technology we have now. So we can build uh, the, an instrument with the same size, the same power, but with so much capabilities in terms of mass resolution, in terms of uh, um, discoveries of organic materials. That's, uh, you know, that's what we want to do. Yeah, well, one of uh, the scientists, Czech scientists, who cooperated with you, Maria Behonkova, said in April that uh, it would be difficult to install the probe on the on the orbit of, of Enceladus. It, uh, how? Why is it so possible? And is and is it is it going to be possible to to put? The... 
I program. think we, we, we can find solutions. Uh, you know, I, I have been working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory for um, 10 years now, uh, and I'm working with the people, who, uh, we call them the navigators. Uh, you know, they, they find trajectories for the different spacecraft in the solar system. I mean, these guys are amazing. Uh, even in Cassini, uh, in orbit around Saturn, uh, we did things that, you know, we, we didn't think we, we would be able to do. At some point, they said, you know, if you want to fly close to Enceladus, you can fly at one kilometer from the surface. Well, the program manager didn't let them do that. You know, they didn't want to risk the mission. So we flew a little bit higher. But so we can find uh, uh, trajectories. But the thing is that Enceladus is very small. Uh, so the gravity, uh, the attraction by gravity is really small. Uh, so you first need to get in orbit around Saturn, uh, and then you need to get in orbit around Enceladus. Uh, and this is very, very um, difficult. Uh, now, if you want to land uh, on Enceladus, uh, I think that that may be easier. But, uh, you know, there is no atmosphere, uh, so yeah. you need to slow down uh, the lander. You don't want to crash on the surface. Uh, so you have some other challenges to, um, uh, to, to solve. But... We're working uh, on that, you know. It's uh, it's part of uh, of my work to uh, to see what we can do and what we cannot do uh, in the in the future. And what, when we see the future, it's between now and 25 years or 30 years from now. Yeah, the f last year when you uh, made an interview in Czech magazine the Respect, you is you estimated it it would be at first at 2030, like in like. 15 years from now. So is it still possible to get it this early, like to go to Enceladus this early in 15 years? Yeah, it's possible that we will be there. Actually, because of the discoveries that we made uh, uh, at Enceladus and at another satellite, uh, which is named Titan, uh, um, the, um, there is one program in the US uh, And they opened that yeah. program uh, to explore Enceladus and Titan. Uh, the launch would be in 2024 or 2025. Uh, it takes seven years to go there. Uh, so, you know, we get there in 2031-32. So, you know, maybe too optimistic last year. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's close enough, uh, you know. Yeah. So it's possible that we will be there in 2031. Yeah. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, during your lecture, you said that NASA wasn't too happy about uh, including Enceladus into New Frontiers uh, program. Uh, why is so? Well, so NASA, the way we uh, NASA um, um, establishes uh, the missions uh, is through what we call the decadal survey. So every 10 years, uh, the scientists uh, uh, meet and they, they build the program for the next 10 years. And so the last time was in 2012, and they built the program for 2013 to 2022. Um, And in that um, in that program, uh, you have different um, lines, uh, and one line is called the New Frontiers program. Um, uh, and in this New Frontiers program, uh, they had five targets, and so they didn't want to include a new one. They say, well, you know, the scientists, uh, the scientific community uh, has not been consulted, so we don't want to to include that. Uh, But the discoveries were so amazing uh, that there is pressure by the scientists. Hey, come on, I mean, it's obvious uh, that we need to open that program. I mean, the program, La uh, NASA is very much on finding life somewhere else, uh, um, you know, whether it's in the solar system or elsewhere. Uh, so it's high priority. Uh, it's really the priority of your program to, to do that. Uh, So at the end, uh, it was included uh, into the New Frontiers program. And when I saw for the announcement of opportunity, yeah, I was so happy, you know, I said, well, okay, we can work and we can propose something. I've never thought about that. Uh, there's a problem with uh, preventing the contamination yeah. of the other planet. So is it really possible that uh, in that, I don't know, let's talk about Enceladus. So in that 15, 20 years, mm -hmm. we uh, gonna have the technology, but we won't be able to prevent something these some micro organization that sorry so some microbes or something like that to to go to Enceladus. is it possible that the, the mission won't get the green light because of that no actually the mission we are proposing the next one uh, does not have this problem because what is absolutely fascinating about Enceladus is that the ocean is coming to you so you don't need to go into the ocean so you can have an orbiter just uh, grabbing the sample, the ocean, which is yep. coming out of Enceladus. And in that case, we don't have any problem of contamination. We just take the samples and then we analyze the samples in the spacecraft. Uh, 
So there is no contamination issue. The contamination issue would be uh, if we land on the surface of Enceladus uh, and then if we drill in order to go to the ocean. Then in that or, case... Or, for uh, example, on, on Europa. And then, yeah, yeah, the same applies to Europa. But on Europa, you... Well, we, you don't have the same evidences that there, are, there is yeah. geysers coming out. So in Europa, we are planning to land on Europa. So in that case, uh, we have to apply the planetary protection rules. Uh, uh, and uh, I can tell you that the officers are very strict about how you explore the solar system. And, you know, they don't let you uh, send some microbes or some terrestrial organisms on, on the surface. Yeah. We were talking about uh, the Czech scientists. Uh, I, I wanted to ask about like how important the input of the Czech scientists is for your work. Like which, how big, let's say, how big portion of the work was made here. But well, I think we we would not have written that paper without the participation of the Czech scientists. Um, what I found uh, uh, amazing when we started uh, the collaboration uh, with Andrej is, is that. Um, they have this very good school in terms of numerical uh, modeling. Uh, you know, how you have the physics, the, the equations that describe the physics and the chemistry. Yeah. And I say, well, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I mean, they, they do it very well here. Uh, why don't we collaborate with them uh, instead of doing the same thing either in France or in the US? Uh? So that's, that's, you know, how I started the, the collaboration. And, uh, and it works great because we have very complementary skills. Uh, and I think it's the best way to make progress in science is just to collaborate. And, I, you know, I, I like international collaboration. And the Cassini mission was a great example of uh, international collaboration. More than 30 countries uh, have been involved in this mission. So it's just great uh, to, to, to look at the skills that exist in different countries. Yeah, it's uh, it's great. I mean, I really, I really like, and you know, it gives me the opportunity to come to Prague, and that's that's perfect. I mean, the other thing which I think is is really important is exploration of the solar system does not belong to one country. It's really the, the for, it's for all the countries. So as you know, when we can get the participation from uh, from any country, it's always welcome. And we were talking about it. How how does it work when you uh, you are co cooperating with people from France, from Germany, from Czech Republic, uh, from US, of course, from other countries? So you travel a lot, or you're using a phone, just ha having some teleconferences, or well, my family says that I travel a lot, but actually <laughs> we do a lot of work just by uh, Webex or uh, you know calling each other. We try in order to make progress on a on a project on a study. Yeah, we try to have one telecon every week, yeah, so we select uh, the the time, uh, which sometimes is difficult because well, on Cassini, for example, we had someone at Hawaii, someone on the west coast of the U.S., east coast of the U.S., someone in in Europe. Uh, so to find the good time was uh, kind of tricky. Yeah. But uh, that's uh, the way we work. It uh, we have one telecon every week, um, and uh, and then at some point uh, we we need to meet. Uh, I think it's uh, quite important. Actually, the meetings or the workshops uh, we go to are so good opportunities. Uh, to spend a few hours to see where where we stand, uh, uh, to discuss. Uh, it's. It's still much more productive uh, to be present and to spend time uh, uh, discussing about the, the results uh, than to do it by, by phone. But yeah. you can make a lot of progress by, by phone. And emails, you know, it's, uh, it, it changed uh, our life uh, on Cassini uh, when we had these emails uh, starting in the, so when was that, 90, 93, 94, I guess. Uh, as you said, the the Cassini mission is over. Actually, your your article is, let's say, the the, the dot <laughs> after after the mission. So, uh, what's your next project in JPL? Okay, so first uh, I would say that the the paper uh, is not the dot. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the, you the, use all the data, so yeah, like, we use yeah, all the data. Yeah. But I, I think that there are still a lot of data from, from the Cassini mission which have uh, not been used. Okay. So there are still room uh, for, um, you know, more papers. Uh, actually, we are working, for example, on Titan. Uh, we accumulated uh, a lot of data, and all those data uh, have not been uh, uh, put into a model that can that, that can explain them. So there is uh, still, uh, you know, more papers that are going to come, maybe not for answer others, but at yeah. least for, for Titan. Uh, um, so, well, 
I won't have any more Cassini funding, so you know I need to leave. <laughs> so I am working on other projects. As I told you, I, I submitted a, a project to go back to Titan. I, I am also associated with a project to go back to Enceladus. Uh, I'm working on a project to go to Venus. Uh, mm -hmm. I am working on a, another project to go to a nice giant, uh, maybe uh, Neptune and look at uh, Neptune Triton. Uh, my job actually in the, at GPL, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, is to um, design new missions, uh, to look at the science questions that we have, uh, how we can answer those questions, uh, and what kind of instruments uh, need to be developed uh, and what kind of mission uh, we need to, to build. Um, uh, could you say maybe uh, to, you know, to sum up the interview, like could you say you have some dream mission like you want to accomplish? Well, yeah, well, it's quite a dream, but I think that uh, and it, it won't be for me, okay? Yeah, but the dream mission... Um, would be to explore the ocean of Enceladus or Europe. So it means that I want to drill through the crust, uh, get a submarine in the ocean, and then uh, you know go and see if we have these hydrothermal vents and see what looks like uh, going to the bottom of the ocean. So maybe I am biased by the fact that um, when I was a teenager, uh, I was just amazed by this geologist uh, diving uh, into this uh, submersible, going to the terrestrial seafloor, and the fact that they discovered life. Uh, because yeah. at that time, uh, no one thought about life uh, at those depths. Uh, and they were looking for rocks, uh, and they found life. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's kind of my dream mission. And also, I was born in the same city as Jules Verne. And so, you know, I was raised reading the, his books. Uh, and yeah, it's a kind of Jules Verne, uh, Jules Verne mission. But at some point, the technologies will be ready to do that. You, you said it's probably not going to be for you. So do you have some idea of, of the timeline when it could be like 10 years, like or 50, 60 years? Uh, I think it's going to to take uh, yeah um, between 35 and 50 years uh, before we we have all that because you need to send other missions in order to prepare that kind of mission so we need at least uh, two missions uh, it takes seven years to go there uh, so it takes five years to develop the mission so we were talking about you know 12 15 years uh, so you do these two missions and then uh, you drill uh, so yeah it's uh, between 35 and 50 years okay i wish you good luck with that well thank you very much and you know uh, that's why it's good to work with young people and to uh, to to have them working on these projects Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks a lot for having me here. It's yeah. a pleasure to answer the questions. Mm -hmm.